I don't know what it is, but there's something about teen movies adapted from famous literary works that just hit different. To be clear, Easy A is not an adaptation of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, but it is inspired by it. Easy A is a 2010 teen comedy directed by Will Gluck and written by Bert V. Royal. The plot follows Olive Pendergast, a witty 17-year-old high school student who lies to her best friend about losing her virginity and faces the positive and negative consequences of the rumor spreading throughout her entire school. For the time, the premise was racy enough to draw attention, but the actual plot and conflict of Easy A is not where the movie shines. It's good, and it's there, and it works, but ultimately, what makes this film memorable comes down to its lovable protagonist, clever dialogue, and exceptional performances from Emma Stone and the supporting cast. We're going to analyze the characters, dialogue, thematic elements, and how Easy A refreshes and subverts typical genre-prevalent tropes and devices. We're going to break down what works and why it works and why what doesn't work doesn't work. But first, a spoiler warning for the following. Most of these are just references in passing, but some of them I relate to the film and kind of break down deeper. All thoughts and opinions are my own, and sources and resources are linked below. Do you remember those interviews of Anne Hathaway and Scarlett Johansson being objectified by their interviewers and responding with just unbelievable patience and grace? Well, is, well, huh? is it inappropriate? To ask somebody what kind of underpants they wear? I didn't ask you what kind. You just asked me if I was wearing any. Any particular workout? Are you trying to lose weight? Well, like, <laughs> what's, what's the deal, man? You look great. No, no, no. Emma Stone also deserves reparations for what she had to put up with during the press junket for this movie because, wow. You wear an interesting wardrobe in this movie. Yes, I do. Were any from your personal collection? All of them were from my personal collection. I usually keep them at the moment, though. Yes. What has been so far the most outrageous costume you've ever worn? Oh. Um, most of the stuff I had to wear for the house bunny was outrageous to me because I'm very uncomfortable in booty shorts. Even so, you wear them very nicely. By far the best actor I've ever worked with and uh, is going to be a gigantic superstar. If you've seen the movie, you can, I hope you agree. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. I mean, she wore some of those outfits. Uh, she did. Quite well. But, uh, so I felt, Neil say I felt comfortable in public, oh, yeah. in lingerie. You looked comfortable. I <sighs> Emma Stone was fresh off of Zombieland a year prior, which earned her more recognition, but she wasn't yet a household name. In the next few years, she would go on to be in bigger projects with huge critical and box office success. But at this point, she was still fairly new to fame. Easy A would be her first role in a feature film where she played the main character. To be in the movie, she had to drop out of Sucker Punch. And thank God she did, because I cannot imagine anyone else playing Olive. And Sucker Punch just looks terrible. <laughs> In terms of its place in pop culture, Easy A is a unique case. It definitely achieved financial success at the box office, grossing $75 million worldwide, with an only $8 million budget. When compared to some films with similar genres and target markets that came out around the same time, Easy A strongly held its own. If we were to look at teen films from the most mainstream to the most cult, Easy A would fall somewhere in the middle between mainstream and cult status, leaning a little closer to cult status than not. Despite its somewhat dated premise that, let's admit, was a little far-fetched even in 2010, Easy A has since maintained and even strengthened its status as an intelligent teen comedy. So here's the thing. I love digging into scripts and picking them apart and comparing them to their corresponding movies or episodes, but I can't really do that with Easy A. There's this saying in screenwriting, the script is only the blueprint and the film is the final product. I'm not a huge fan of that phrase in general, but in this case, it's entirely accurate. Easy A's script and Easy A's film have significant differences to the point where they're largely separate works in my mind. The director, Will Gluck, revised a lot of the original script, I think for the better. And granted, the majority of the script that didn't make the film are just jokes that were cut before shooting or in the editing room. Many other changes are small and were most likely altered out of convenience. Like in an early draft, Todd's mascot was a meerkat, not a woodchuck. Mr. Griffith was Mr. Griffin. Olive and Anson's date was originally a red lobster, not the lobster shack. But there are other things, dialogue, actions, characters, personalities, and dynamics with each other that change the story as a whole. In the script, Olive's a little meaner, a little cockier, a little rougher around the edges in a way that might make her character less likable. There's a draft in which Rhiannon's parents are not weird hippies, but alcoholics. 
That distinction is transformative to her character, and it was changed for a reason. Mr. Griffith wasn't sardonic and deadpan. He was goofy and kind of a dork. And I don't like that. I don't want to know that. <laughs> I don't like the idea of his lines being delivered in a dorky way. Passion. Kill the beat. I'm not going to rap for you guys, okay? It's pandering and it's been done before. And so I'm going to reference the script less than I typically would because I don't think it's fair to cherry pick parts that I want to examine in relation to the movie while disregarding other portions of the screenplay that don't exist in the final product. If I accept or validate one part of the script that was cut, I have to accept or validate the entirety of it. Which I don't want to do, because the changes that were made in the movie were intentionally transformative, and ultimately better. So let's hope that I can stick to that. The reviews were mostly positive, but a repeating criticism that tended to come up in the negative ones lies with the dialogue. Not that it isn't witty, but that it's too witty. Because in real life, teenagers don't talk like that. I can't stand this argument, because dialogue does not have to be accurate to real life to be realistic. It just has to be true. It has to fit believably in the confines of the world that it's in. There should be consistency in its tone and style, and really, it is a style. You wouldn't put down Starry Night for being an inaccurate depiction of the night sky, and you wouldn't tell Salvador Dali, hey, just so you know, clocks don't really do that. Because, obviously, it's not how you say it. It's what you say. To compare, let's examine the most quintessential example of unrealistic teen dialogue that just doesn't work. Apologies in advance. When a show like Riverdale has their teen characters adopt what some middle-aged writer thinks is real-life teen vernacular, you get lines like this. My girl and I need a reason to live tonight. She just broke up with her bow. Full spiral. Tragic. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. You wanted fire? Sorry, Cheryl, bombshell. My specialty's ice. And from those lines, you get videos like this. Obviously, it's incredibly hard to watch because they're trying so hard to be something that they're not. These writers are attempting to pander to an audience they don't understand. And what takes it from bad to cringeworthy is how they do it with such misplaced, steely-eyed conviction. They think that's how teenagers speak. And the teenagers watching can sense the inauthenticity. Inauthenticity that makes the characters feel like cheap, condescending caricatures. There's no substance or story or style. It's just these adult writers pining for teen approval so outlandishly that it's embarrassing. They're throwing themselves at 16-year-olds' feet, begging to relate, to be thought of as edgy or cool. Which, well, by definition, is the antithesis of cool. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. Oh, uh, it hurts. An easy A, Olive does not talk like your average 17-year-old either. She makes pop culture references to movies that came out decades before the target demographic was born, uses double entendres you have to pick apart, and says pointedly big words that wouldn't even make the SAT vocab section. But when Olive speaks in a way that teenagers typically don't, nothing about it feels condescending, annoying, or artificial. If anything, she comes across as charming and funny. It works because Olive is not speaking from a place of superiority, but of jest. She sounds like she's joking, almost self-effacing in her delivery. Inexactitude, which is really just my obnoxious way of saying that lies travel fast. And when likable, cool Emma Stone says words that the average teenager doesn't know, it just shows she isn't necessarily concerned with whether the audience comprehends it or not which is the definition of cool. Because sometimes, we like not getting things. Hear me out. When Olive tells jokes or makes references that the audience doesn't understand, it forces them to have to think and be challenged. Even if it's just Googling what incorrigible means, it changes the dynamic between viewer and protagonist. It makes the audience think the characters know something they don't which not only makes her more interesting as a character, but makes the audience want to listen more to what she has to say. This is the same type of thinking that sometimes makes us laugh at jokes we don't understand, because we want the person who tells it to think we're smart or topical or cool enough to get it. Like, before watching Easy A, I had never seen Say Anything, but all of referencing it made me want to watch it, because I wanted to be in on the joke. We are led through the plot by Olive's narration, which we later learn doubles as the film's resolution by being a platform where she confesses the truth to her peers. 
Because Olive spends a good portion of the film either on her own or lying, this narrative device is incredibly helpful in cluing the audience in to what she's actually thinking and feeling. The plot very blatantly shows Olive as deceitful, but through her narration, we as an audience get to experience a self-effacing, sometimes very vulnerable, honest side of her, which makes her more sympathetic, but also makes us feel kind of special. So in the revised script, Olive often acknowledges or talks to the audience of her webcast, not us, but the peers who are actually watching it. Sometimes this is a casual reference to something her classmates know. Sometimes it's directly to a specific person watching the webcast. These are spread all throughout the script. But in the movie, aside from the very end, all of these references were taken out. Mary Ann Bryant is the secretary of the student council. This could have been changed to keep an element of surprise for the webcast's actual purpose until the reveal at the end. But some of these instances are so subtle, I don't think it would really have made much of a difference. What's more likely is these little references were removed to establish a more intimate relationship between Olive and the audience. So it feels like she's talking to us, and only us, until we arrive at the film's resolution. It's an incredibly small distinction, but it makes a big difference in how we perceive Olive. There are a myriad of movies that include first-person narration, but not as many also have the visual of that person talking to the camera too. We are so used to characters ignoring cameras, ignoring us, that when they look at the lens, it can be startling. I mean, they're literally making eye contact with you. Combine that with actually talking directly to you, and it's even more intimate. This is part of what makes characters like Fleabag, Ferris Bueller, and Wade Wilson so beloved. Their respective movies and TV series are completely different, but they engage directly with the audience on a level of authenticity that makes us feel close to them. When Fleabag effortlessly tells us her most private thoughts, we love her for it, and we forget that we don't even know her name. When Deadpool pauses during a tense moment to tell us a joke, we're endeared by him. Ferris Bueller is iconically dishonest with everyone except for us, so we feel special getting to know what he really thinks. Olive swaying us against the Demi Moore Scarlet Letter adaptation makes us feel like she's our friend. With these references left in, we're only spectators. But without them, we are participants. Taking out these direct acknowledgments of her classmates allows the illusion that Olive is talking to us. It gives the movie the benefits of breaking the fourth wall without ever actually breaking the fourth wall. While intelligent teen female leads existed before, there was a welcomed surge in the late 90s and early 2000s where a specific beloved type of protagonist became prominent in mainstream media. These characters are precocious, independent, clever, funny, and uniquely charming. Olive Pendergast falls into this category, checking all of these boxes and perfecting the line between relatable and cool. She's introverted, with literally only one friend, opting to spend her weekend lounging around in her room with her dog. But she's also outgoing, confidently engaging in public back and forths, performing in front of the school, and striking up conversations with her peers. We haven't talked in a while. How have you been, Brendan? Beyond her sense of humor and wit, at her core, Olive is kind. Granted, like everyone, she is capable of meanness and her impulsivity doesn't help with that, but intrinsically, she is a caring person who is considerate of those around her. We see this constantly when she accepts Marianne's friendship despite having no reason to be nice to her, when she willingly takes the fall for Mrs. Griffith, but we can even see Olive's kindness reflected in scenes where her negative traits are supposed to take center stage. This begins from Olive's very first lie. Olive tells Rhiannon that she has a date with a college student that goes to school with her brother. The impetus of this lie is not to change Olive's reputation or how Rhiannon sees her. It's an excuse to get out of going on a camp trip with Rhiannon's family because her parents make her uncomfortable and Olive doesn't want to hurt her feelings. When Rhiannon confronts her after the weekend, Olive denies sleeping with her fictional date several times before she relents and discovers that she likes the sensationalism of the lie and feeling superior to Rhiannon. And though this is where Olive leans into her central character flaw, it's her consideration for other people that leads her there in the first place. This pattern repeats itself throughout the film. We see it again with the lie for Brandon. So please just help me because I can't take another day of this. I don't know what I'll do. Olive's empathy 
is the deciding factor when she agrees to help Brandon, not her desire for popularity. The same is true for Evan. When will high school end already? Shit. Yes, Olive likes the attention of being talked about. She likes the reputation the lies give her. That is her flaw. But time and time again, we see that she is primarily motivated by compassion. This distinction gives nuance to her actions, making her more complex as a character and a more likable protagonist. While I do believe we generally tend to treat fictional teen girls with less grace and understanding than fictional teen boys, there's not a lot to hate about Olive. When it comes to her negative traits, she is impulsive, stubborn, and craves attention from her peers. How do you know I like being thought of as a floozy? Because at least you're being thought of. From a screenwriting perspective, these are the best, worst traits they could have given her, simply because they're notoriously pertinent to being a teenager, and thus are bound to resonate with a large portion of the movie's demographic. And not that they can't be, but really, as far as negative character traits go, they aren't horrible. She wants people in her grade to notice her. What a monster. And for every bad quality that Olive exemplifies, there's an added positive factor, level of nuance, or logical reasoning that makes her actions easier to sympathize with. Something we can really sympathize with Olive about is her terrible best friend, Rhiannon, played by Ali Mishaka. The very first thing we are shown of Rhiannon is her standing by, deliberately not helping as Olive picks up her scattered papers off the ground, which we can view as foreshadowing for how unhelpful Rhiannon will be as a friend to Olive in this movie. But seriously, they're hanging on by a codependent thread. It's pretty clear Olive and Rhi's friendship leans on routine, familiarity, and nostalgia of being childhood friends more than complementary personalities or actual love and fondness for each other. Rhiannon isn't a bad friend 100% of the time. There are shades of gray in their friendship that make it more realistic than her just being blatantly horrible every moment she's on screen. That being said, if we were to weigh the pros and the cons, the scale would not tip in her favor. Rhiannon steamrolls Olive constantly and enjoys having some control over her. Re projects herself as a sex-positive person. She likes being known as someone with experience, and to a degree, she likes being indirectly sexualized by her peers. Big tits. That's my identifier? Yes! She encourages Olive to have similar experiences, but as soon as she hears about Brandon and Olive, her excitement turns to judgment, and she lashes out. Afterwards, Ree tries to embarrass Olive in front of their classmates. And then, in the brief period when Olive and Marianne become friends, Ree scoffs and glares from the sidelines. When Marianne slaps Olive, Ree just grins smugly. She then joins the literal mob against Olive, content with ostracizing her from everyone. And then we learn, narratively, really for no reason at all, that Re knowingly kissed Olive's crush in ninth grade. It's all a little much. Like, a little too much. So <laughs> here's the thing. Rhiannon is in love with Olive. And I'm not saying that like, like it's my opinion, and this is the theory that I've come up with from analyzing their interactions. I'm saying that, canonically, in the script, in reaction to Olive's webcast, it says, quote, Re seems contemplative. Maybe it's because she's been in love with Olive since grade school. Duh. End quote. You know, at the time, there weren't exactly a ton of depictions of young queer female characters in mainstream media. But I really wish the movie had hinted at Rhiannon's feelings more. Because I don't think most people from watching Easy A picked up on unrequited romantic subtext between Re and Olive. Before reading the script, I'd seen the movie like half a dozen times and it never occurred to me. Which feels intentional. I don't think they wanted it to. But really, this fact completely recontextualizes their relationship and provides so much clarity and insight into Re's actions that we weren't privy to. Without the context, Ree's motives seem rooted in simplistic, petty jealousy for Olive's reputation. But with the context, there's so much more nuance in her thinking that in turn make her actions not only more plausible in their severity toward Olive, but more complex as well. It doesn't justify Ree's actions, but it does make them more interesting. And it is disappointing that the majority of people who like this movie probably don't get to know this side of it. Like the exact moment you turn into such a badass? I think I'm in love with you. Okay. Easy A's more intentional mean girl comes in the character of Marianne Bryant, played by Amanda Bynes. 
We know the cliches of the trope well. They're frequently the most popular girl at school. Rich, with an expensive car. Head cheerleader. White. Blonde. Conventionally attractive. Passive-aggressive. Aside from her clothing style, Marianne's physical description checks out. But she doesn't quite fit the standard alpha mean girl box. Outside of her little congregation, she's not exactly popular. She is pretty hated. And not in a, oh, they hate her because they want to be her kind of way. Like, it's a very pure brand of resentment. No, I think she's just a stuck-up Jesus freak. All right, you know that snotty Jesus freak office aid I have? Like, I hate Marianne Bryant, too. If that's our magical connection, I should just date the entire school. And granted, the animosity is completely warranted. Marianne Bryant is judgmental, hypocritical, and self-righteous in the worst way. But my god, she's so fun to watch. What the hell are you looking at, Sister Christian? Just a couple of admitted whores. By subverting some of the cliches of the trope, while still fulfilling the same mean girl role as antagonist towards our protagonist, Marianne's character adds a splash of color that further sets Easy A apart from other movies in the same genre. And maybe it's Amanda Bynes' performance, but it is hard to fully hate her character. Marianne's bigotry is so laughably illogical and misguided that it makes her almost pitiable. If God wanted him to graduate, God would have given him the right answers. <laughs> a little over halfway into the movie, Olive comforts Marianne, unintentionally causing a sudden dynamic shift between them. Just when we think we have Marianne's character completely pegged, she does a complete 180. In a matter of seconds, Marianne goes from thinking of Olive as an enemy to a best friend. Can we please be friends? Absolutely. Yay! Yay! A total role reversal, and we get this hilarious montage of their day of friendship. The best part about it is how genuine Marianne is. She just dives headfirst into this friendship without any reservation. Just her heart on her sleeve and sudden but truly genuine affection for Olive, who she was outwardly condemning like that same day. But all of that hatred is forgotten. Marianne is in this friendship. It is completely contradictory to what we've seen of her, but somehow it doesn't feel contrived. Her enthusiasm and excitement are fully authentic, and it really works with the movie's tone. And in response, Olive just kind of goes with it. She's really just along for the ride, kind of tolerating Marianne, but kind of indulging her too, which just creates such an interesting dynamic, especially when we look at what it used to be. Marianne becomes this harmless, somewhat childlike character that Olive, despite having no real reason to, besides sheer kindness and maybe loneliness, welcomes with open arms. This montage offers a comedic moment of levity before one of the more dramatic scenes in the film. It's only a minute and 30 seconds long, and that's including Micah in the hospital. But it's a breath of fresh air we didn't even know we needed, and is one of the greatest scenes in the whole movie. Even though popularity is at the forefront of Easy A's premise, we don't really see a lot of it. When these rumors spread, they travel quickly through nameless crowds, faces we see momentarily and forget instantly. Olive likes the idea of notoriety, but there isn't a specific person or group of people that Olive is trying to impress or befriend. This may seem lazy, like her character's wants weren't fleshed out enough but I think it's an unconventionally realistic representation of what popularity actually looks like and how illusory the desire for it really is. It's sort of like people who want to be famous just to be famous. Their desire often stems from a deeper need for validation and attention that they may lack in their lives. If we break it down and get to the root of why Olive wants popularity, we can see a similar story. Yes, Olive's home life is exceptionally warm and attentive, but in school and with her peers, she lacks genuine connection. While Olive is friendly to her classmates and the cordial way kids who have gone to school together since kindergarten are with each other, at the start of the film, she only has one friend, her best friend, Rhiannon. And that relationship is not exactly emotionally fulfilling. On a deeper level, Olive longs for real connection with people her own age. It's when she starts to build these genuine relationships that she grows as a person. Her conversation with Todd is the catalyst for her decision to end the rumors. Now that I knew there were actually decent and good-hearted people out there, the lies had to stop. 
played by Penn Badgley, Woodchuck Todd is one of the most underappreciated male love interests from any teen movie. Now, Woodchuck Todd gets put down for being a satellite love interest, a character who basically just exists to serve as a love interest to the main character and doesn't have much value or purpose beyond that. And granted, Todd doesn't get a lot of screen time, and he's not a huge part of the story, but what we do see of him says so much about his character, which is more fleshed out than it seems. Our introduction to Todd is a hilarious and memorable one. While Olive narrates about Mary and Bryant, we see a cutaway where we learn Todd was the school's mascot, who did cool tricks and dunked basketballs shirtless while his peers cheered from the bleachers. This was the status quo until Mary and Bryant petitioned for the school to change their mascot. Give it up for the Woodchucks! Go Woodchucks! Hey, 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 hey. Even wearing a completely humiliating costume, Todd somehow gives the exact same amount of enthusiasm and vigor, all to no applause, by the way. Completely lost on this crowd. And then he tries to dunk the ball, and he falls flat on his face in front of the entire school. One of the most embarrassing situations I can imagine in a high school setting. But the thing is, to be embarrassed, you have to actually be embarrassed. And he is just so unaffected. I mean, the costume alone would be reason enough for anyone to quit. But even after this performance, even after being dubbed Woodchuck Todd, Todd continues to be the school mascot because he does not care what other people think. This is a fundamental part of Todd's character, which, yes, foils Olive's outlook, but is also a stark contrast to who he used to be. In the flashback of Todd and Olive in 8th grade, during 7 Minutes in Heaven, he asks her to lie and say that they kissed because he's terrified of what his classmates think of him. So within the four years between this scene and when we meet him, Todd undergoes massive character development, completely off screen, because there is no way this kid would have worn that costume in front of the entire school or gotten a job where he had to sing happy birthday wearing a lobster hat. Romance is a minuscule part of Easy A, which is refreshingly rare for a teen comedy, even by today's standards. Olive doesn't spend the movie pursuing Todd, he's not her hyperfixation, and she doesn't have an epiphany that she's in love with him at the end of the second act either. She just likes him, and she kind of always has. The same is pretty much true for Todd. They cross paths a few times throughout the movie, usually in between significant story beats or when Olive is wrapped up in the plot. Todd's appearance offers a brief respite. It's nothing life-altering. They just talk and joke for a bit. But in these brief moments, he's a solid, friendly presence that takes Olive out of the drama and makes her feel normal. Their relationship, although we don't see a lot of it, is very complimentary. They're a good match for each other. Unlike other guys we meet, Todd can actually keep up with Olive's wittiness. My name is an anagram for I love. What's a, what's an anagram? Say lovey. Lovey. Nice. Mm. Solid joke. <laughs> In line with what we've established of Todd's character, his feelings for Olive aren't at all changed by her negative reputation at school. He doesn't believe the rumors, but he never pushes Olive for the truth. Like Olive's parents, he makes himself accessible, but he doesn't pry and he doesn't judge her. He's genuinely just a good guy. One of Todd's best qualities is his ability to listen. At the end of the movie, when he interrupts Olive's webcast, he says, I, uh, I, I borrowed my neighbor's mower. I came right over. That almost rhymed. I know. I spent a minute on it. It's easy to chalk this dialogue up to their typical playful banter, but it's actually a callback to another scene. Because earlier in the movie, he rhymed here with beer, and she said that she liked it. I'm here. Can I get you a beer? That rhymed. I liked it. And of course, all of Todd's actions in this scene also serve as a testament to him being a good listener. In Olive's webcast, she proclaims that she wants her life to be like an 80s movie. Just once. I want my life to be like an 80s movie. Todd hears that and doesn't even wait for the webcast to finish. He skips on the plot drama, gets his neighbor's lawnmower, and heads to her house, recreating the scene from Can't Buy Me Love. I want to ride off on a lawnmower with Patrick Dempsey. Not only that, but he holds up his speakers outside her window like in Say Anything. I want John Cusack holding a boombox outside my window. And if that wasn't enough, 
Instead of the song that John Cusack plays, Todd chooses Don't You Forget About Me, referencing The Breakfast Club. I want Judd Nelson thrusting his fist into the air because he knows he got me. In one fell swoop, Todd effectively recreates three of all of 80s movie fantasies. Preferably one with a really awesome musical number, for no apparent reason. So, I mean, I would personally dock points for wanting more of Todd and Easy A. But it's kind of cancelled out by what this movie can establish with a character with such limited screen time. Now, let's talk about one of the best aspects of this movie. Olive's parents, played exceptionally by Stanley Tucci and Patricia Clarkson. I'm a big believer in the Stanley Tucci effect, a phenomenon wherein Stanley Tucci makes everything that he's in substantially better, no matter the size of the role and even if the thing was already great to begin with. Easy A is not an exception. He kills it. And so does Patricia Clarkson. How she can play this mom and also be the mother from Sharp Objects is the definition of range. Together, they are a perfect duo, as Rosemary and Dill Pendergast. They are probably the best set of fictional parents I've seen in a comedy. Honestly, maybe in any movie, in any genre, ever. Truly, they are the blueprint. Even in the script, there's a foundational emphasis on the fact that Olive likes hanging out with her family. They sit down for dinner together every night, and they have weekly family movie nights. The closeness Olive and her family have is something that isn't necessarily unheard of in teen movies. But Dill and Rosemary's parenting style is difficult to compare to anything else. Regarding their children's lives, they are curious, but not invasive. Relaxed, but not negligent. Interested, but completely non-judgmental. Within this space, there's a sense of safety that encourages openness. We can see this in the ease of their interactions, like when Olive freely tells them she was sent to the principal's office. Her mother's immediate response is, Did you win a medal or something? Olive doesn't have to tell them about getting in trouble at school, but she does anyway. In response, they're barely phased. They're inquisitive, but they don't pry and they don't become angry or reprimand her because they know the kid they raised. I guess we're lucky that this is not a common occurrence. They know she's smart and empathetic, and in many ways, they trust her judgment. Come here. And I bet that girl was acting like exactly what you called her. Oh, you have no idea. In the movie, Dill and Rosemary are pretty much unaware of what's happening with all of its school, but they notice changes in her that naturally concern them. And they make this concern clear to Olive in playful ways. It's no judgment, but you kind of look like a stripper. Mom! A high-end stripper. During and in between joking, they freely express their love to her. I would take a bullet for you. You know that. Right between the eyes. They both draw examples from their own personal experiences to connect with Olive and make her feel more comfortable, even if it sometimes does the opposite. You know, I dated a homosexual once. For a long time, actually. No judgment. All God's children. It's fine. I was gay once for a while. I slept with a whole bunch of people, a slew, a heap, a peck, mostly guys. Mom! When Olive does withhold information from her parents, it's because she wants to deal with her problems on her own, not because she's scared of them judging or punishing her. They acquiesce and give her the space she wants, but consistently make it very clear that they are unconditionally and non-judgmentally there for her, if or when she needs their support. Do you need to talk to us about something? Sweetie? I just want you to know your father and I are totally supportive. As Olive's problems increase throughout the film's progression, they continue to make this clear. You're kind of starting to worry us a little. Should we be kind of worried a little? I don't think so. Sure. Obviously not every kid is the same, but for older teenagers like Olive, this type of laissez-faire parental support is invaluable, and it's so refreshing to see it portrayed in a movie not bogged down by sentimental monologues, but instead with an added layer of humor and lightheartedness. While their typical humor may strike some as too relaxed, they know when to be serious too. Like, when Olive doesn't play along with Dill's teasing, he immediately becomes serious. Dad, can you shut the door, please? You all right, buddy? In the script for this scene, it says... Dill looks at his daughter. Dill, you all right, buddy? Olive looks up at her dad. It's a real moment. He really cares. And she knows it. She takes a beat, then nods. It's such a small, sweet scene that says so much. And I'm so glad they kept this in the movie. And in the end, their patience pays off. 
Before the film's resolution, when she's ready and on her own terms, Olive tells her mother everything that happened, and she's met with total support and non-judgment. Can you not see that I'm a mess? No, you're not, Olive. You're wonderful. With an air of levity at its core, Easy A perfectly encapsulates the feeling of being misunderstood. As isolating and arcane as its meaning implies, the reality is feeling misunderstood is not a rare emotion for teenagers. And it's easy to see why Olive might feel this way. Despite Olive's best efforts to communicate, Marianne Bryant doesn't understand her, and subsequently neither does her congregation. Anson doesn't understand her. Her own best friend, Rhiannon, does not understand her. The school counselor doesn't even try to understand her. They don't believe her and they misunderstand her. To all of these people, Olive verbally tries to explain herself, only for it to fall again and again on deaf ears. What you heard in the bathroom the other day wasn't true. It's actually a funny story. Olive. That's your name, right? It didn't happen. Oh, yeah, right. This is Griffith. I really, I don't need yeah, You know what? The pill is not 100% effective. Ask some of your friend's parents. Mm -mm. It's not really how it works. It's OK. Mm -mm. Stop. But even ostracized from her classmates, there are people in Olive's life who really see her for who she is. Her English teacher, Mr. Griffith. Why don't people just watch the original movie like I did? I know you read the book. I did. <laughs> Brandon. Thank you. Cheers. Todd. Don't act like you don't know what people are saying about me. Oh, no, I know what people are saying. Doesn't mean I believe them. And her parents. And I bet that girl was acting like exactly what you called her. Ironically, these are also the people that Olive doesn't have to convince. They either believe her immediately, or they simply already know the truth. This is a subtle reflection of the movie's theme. The people that know who you are, know who you are. And the people that don't, aren't relevant. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. Um, I literally, like my last video, when I first put it out, I had like, I want to say like a hundred subscribers. So if you subscribed after that last video, thank you so much. And if you haven't, please subscribe. Uh, hate saying that, but please subscribe. I honestly, I, I don't know what this is. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. I don't have a niche, you know, I, I like, I like a lot of things, but thank you so much for watching. I really, I really appreciate it.